Okay, so again, just to be clear, when we talk about uniform circular motion, what we're referring to here is motion in a circle, in other words, but by definition, a constant radius, with also a constant speed. Now, to be clear, the velocity is changing simply just because you can't keep us, us uh, you can't keep going in the same direction and, st and stay in a circle, obviously. So, otherwise, so constant speed, constant radius, and the, w without deriving any of this here, because you've hopefully seen it before, turns out that as you go around in a circle, you constantly need an inwards tug. So if you're going around a circle, you constantly need an inwards force to keep you in that circle. So the way I think about this, by the way, is that if you're going, so your, your tangential velocity will always be at right angles to your radial direction. I mean, that's, that's by definition. The R vector and the V vector will always be perfectly at right angles. And the thing is, if any force pushes you from behind, so like this, if this is the radius uh, direction, if this is the velocity direction, if any force pushes you from behind, that's going to cause your velocity to go even faster. So any tangential component of force, any component of force pushing it forward or pulling it back is going to speed it up or slow it down, meaning that we have violated our constant velocity condition. So therefore, the force can only be perpendicular to our velocity. Otherwise, our speed will be changing. And if you think about it, if the force, so if we only have two possibilities, that way or that way, if the force pulled out, that means our velocity is going to veer right. So literally the only possibility we have is the force constantly pulling inwards as we move around, move around in a circle. And the entire effect of that is to change the direction of our velocity vector. If it's always at right angles, it will never change the magnitude. It will just deflect where it's pointing to keep it always tangent to that circle. So not only does it always pull in words, but uh, empirically doing experiments and then theoretically deriving this, I'm gonna do neither. We find that the amount of force required to keep us going in a circle, and I'll write it like this. F cent, you can think of it either as the force pointing to the center or more formally, you guys probably know what it stands for, the centripetal force, we find to be simply just Whatever the mass of that thing is there, clearly that has to play a, a role. If the, the more mass there is, the, the more force is required to move it. But it's literally just mv squared over r. Now again, I'm not deriving that, and that's kind of painful to me because I, I like for people to understand why we got that, not just that we got it. But this is what we call the centripetal force. And again, that points inwards. It always pulls us towards the center of the circle, mv squared over r. Any force pushing us from behind or from the front is gonna speed us up or slow us down. So this has to be in the radial direction. And the proper way that I write this, if we wanna use proper notation, if you wanna call it a vector, it has to point entirely in the r hat direction using polar coordinates, and it's negative r hat because it points inwards. So that's how I would properly write it um, and how I probably will write it for the rest of the semester here, using the proper uh, unit vectors. So, um, there's really not much more to talking about uh, uniform circular motion than simply just applying Newton's second law in this form right here. And what do I mean by that? Um, so this mirrors how you would typically solve any force problem. Uh, and so the way, that we, the way that you would do this here for any sort of a uniform circular motion problem, um, for solving these problems. So really, all we have to do is identify the source of any forces. So like obviously if there's a rope pulling an object like swinging around, the rope is pulling inwards, but you can imagine in theory there might be forces uh, a pushing an object out of, the, out of that circle. So for example, like if you're going around a, um, or if you're going down like a valley, as you approach the bottom of that valley, you might have a normal force pushing you up, but gravity is pulling you down. So you identify the source of any forces that are radial. So any radial forces. And then you use Newton's second law. And this is how I want to say it. You set the sum 
of all the radial forces. And the way I'm going to say it here, the sum of all the FIs, where we have radial, equals the centripetal force. Now, just to make sure to make that work, um, if there's only one force pulling you in, clearly that inwards force equals your centripetal force. If there are multiple forces, if some of them are pulling inwards, some of you are, are trying to divert your motion out from the circle, then you have to reflect the signs properly here. So inwards forces receive a negative sign. The centripetal force is a negative force. Any outwards forces need to have, a, have the opposite sign of both of those there. Um, but the whole point is though, that once you know the actual forces working in any sort of a problem, you add those forces up and set them equal to minus mv squared over r. Again, assuming you've set the signs right here, inwards forces receive a negative sign. Um, and that's essentially all, all that's involved in any sort of a uniform circular motion problem is applying this mv squared over r to the sum of the forces. And the, the one aspect that I kind of like to go through this here is um, applying Newton's law of gravity to uniform circular motion because if you, if you approximate an orbiting body, like our moon, as going in a circle, which is very close, then this applies here. So we'll do this on the other board here. So like I said, we're going to approximate an orbiting body. And let's just say we have Earth here and we have the moon right here. And we're going to make two assumptions here. Number one, we're going to assume that the radius between them stays constant. Turns out we can relax that when we do this properly using the, um, the, the proper vector calculus identities, which we're not going to do the formal version of that here. But it's, it's an assumption that we don't need to worry too much about. But assume that the radius is constant. And also assume that the mass of the central object is much, much, much greater than the mass of that. That's the, the like two or the three in equal signs. So this is very clearly the main central body here, and this is the orbiting body. So that, that needs to be clear. You can't have a case of two equal mass objects, um, at least according to the way I'm gonna set this up. So all we have to do here is recognize that if this is at some radius r, then we can apply Newton's, sorry, we can apply the uniform circular motion uh, equation here and find out how we can relate, for example, the period of motion to the orbital radius here. And so the way we do that here, um, let's take a look at our example problem here. What are the forces involved if you have a planet and its moon? There's only one and it's gravity. And let's take a look at the moon here. Here's the moon. We know for a fact that the gravitational force of Earth I'll just write F sub G for gravitational force of Earth is pulling it in. And so if that's the inwards direction, that needs to have a negative sign. So I'm gonna look at this, there's no other forces. So all I have to do is I'm gonna set the sum of all of the forces, in this case here, is just literally that inwards force of gravity. So that's equal to um, minus FG. Now I'm using the minus sign because that's pointing inwards, radially inwards. And then now all I have to do is set that equal to the centripetal force, which we know as minus. Now, which mass should I use? The mass of the orbiting body. So I'm gonna call it, in, in this case here, I just wrote it as M, um, and I'm gonna leave it as that. Minus M, so whatever the, the orbiting body's mass is, times its velocity squared over R. So that's the centripetal force, that's the gravitational force, because that's the only physical force that's relevant here. And then, and by the way, um, the, the, I'm going to take away the vector signs. If I want to throw in an R hat there and an R hat there, that will do the job. So anyway, um, now the last step here, we can get rid of those negative signs. And if we remember that the gravi Newton's universal law of gravitation says that this is the mass of the Earth, so I'll call it Me times, I'm calling the mass of the orbiting budget, body, the moon, whatever, just m. And then there's that constant g in front of it over r squared. So I'm just literally writing out Newton's law for gravity and I'm negating the negatives. And I'm just going to set that equal to mv squared over r. Now before we cancel out m's, let's make sure we should be able to. In this case here, that stood for the mass of the moon. In this case here, it stood for the mass of the orbiting body, the moon again. 
yes, we can cancel these m's. r squared will cancel one of the factors of the r. And we can rearrange this into something that says that the, um, how should I write this? Um, the radius of an orbiting body, actually, no, I will write it a little bit different. The velocity squared of an orbiting body equals g m e over r. So I've just, I've flipped the sides. I, I've, I've done the uh, cancellation here. And the last thing we need to recognize here is that the velocity is actually a function of the radius itself. So if you recall, um, the velocity is the total distance an object traverses, which in this case here, it's 2 pi r. And the time it takes, I'm going to call that big T, capital T. That's typically what we denote the period. And usually we give the period like little, like you can't quite see, little, little like dips on the T. So it looks like this. So anyway, it kind of looks like that. It's a, it's a T like that for capital T. I don't know why that's a convention, but it is. Um, so anyway, this is what we write as our velocity here. And I'm just going to substitute that in for V. And then I'm going to square everything. So this becomes 2 pi squared r squared over period squared equals, now the right hand side, g m e over r. It's supposed to be r there. Now that looks a little messy, so I'm just going to rewrite it up at the very top here. And we'll see where that gets us. Um, before I do that here, so let's see, this is what I have. Uh, I'm going to make a little bit of substitution here. Let's see. I'm going to move the r to the left hand side, and I'm just going to have my factor r cubed on the left. I'm going to move everything else to the right hand side, so I'll put the constants out in front. r cubed equals uh, g m e over 2 pi squared, or you could write this 4 pi squared, whatever, times the period squared. Now, I mean, you might be wondering why the hell I just like put a box around it. Like, it's an equation. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but it's not just an equation. So what we've done here, let me make that a little nicer. Uh, what we've done is we have taken only the laws of universal uh, gravitation and uniform circular motion. And without knowing anything else, we have just kind of moved some stuff around. And what we have derived now is, in fact, Kepler's third law. Uh, it's been a while since I've done this. So it's kind of fun to rederive it just kind of on the spot here, which is actually what I just did. Um, but so Kepler's third law is super important because um, you know, I mentioned when we talked about Newton's laws of dynamics, how it was so important he recognized the universe worked mathematically. The one exception I would give to that is Kepler himself. Um, Kepler, his role in astronomy, Johannes Kepler in the 1500s, he, he took the life's work of his mentor, Tycho Brahe, um, a Danish astronomer who took incredibly precise calculations and, and observations of planets throughout literally like 40 years of his life and took these incredibly precise data. And, and, and the, as the story goes, it was more or less on his deathbed. He had been working with Kepler for a while, but more or less on his deathbed, he gave his, his book of observations to, to Kepler. Kepler, the mathematician, he was trained mathematically and actually taught math, um, took all these observations. It's like kind of giving someone a, a, dat, a, a computer database file and letting him make sense of it. Kepler was one that recognized, hey, all of this data, when you kind of think of it as a, three to, uh, as a 2D you know, like, um, uh, trajectory, it obeys this law right here. What Kepler realized was that every bit of data that described how planets go says that if you calculate how far a planet is from, from our sun, that's what R stands for in this case, the radius cubed will be directly proportional to the period that that planet takes to go around the sun, squared. In other words, if you can somehow measure how long it takes a planet to get back to the same point in its orbit, you can immediately calculate how far it is from the sun. 
And by the way, in this case here, we're talking about planets orbiting the sun. That should really be the mass of the sun. This is the mass of the orbiting body. So again, the whole point, and I'm not really sure why I did this exact example and no others, but it's fun to do and it's astronomy. So um, that, that's, that's why this is kind of cool to see here. It's a law of how the universe works based uh, simply just on basic, uh, you know, fundamental principles of physics one. So, um, all right. So the last bit that I want to go through here is talking about rotations and um, angular, uh, angular momentum angular uh, kinetic energy.